He's entering his second season here at LSU. Uh, last fall, he signed the number one recruiting class in the country, which is now on campus. So they're part of our 2023 roster. Uh, last season, uh, LSU finished fourth in the SEC, which was our first top four finish in the league since 2017. Uh, Coach Jay developed a uh, first round draft choice, Jacob Berry, who was the uh, sixth overall pick and the first college pick in last year's draft. And Kay Doty was a second round draft choice of the Toronto Blue Jays. So along with all that, uh, LSU was in the top two in the SEC in most every offensive category. And of course, advanced to an NCAA regional round last season. So we're looking forward to uh, year number two under Coach Johnson uh, today. Uh, Coach is gonna speak about fall practice and then he'll take your questions. Uh, I believe we'll have a, a roaming mic as well, so if you could just wait for the microphone to ask your question because this is being streamed uh, on our website and on our Facebook page. And uh, then after Coach is done, we'll have uh, three players. We'll have uh, junior pitcher Ty Floyd, uh, sophomore third baseman Tommy White, who's new to the program this year, transferring from North Carolina State. And our final player will be junior first baseman Trey Morgan. Those guys will be up here one at a time to take your questions. So we'll start with Coach Jay Johnson. All right, good to see everybody. Um, just finished up fall practice yesterday uh, with Purple and Gold World Series, uh, productive fall. Uh, credit to the players. Uh, we've been at it for 14 straight weeks. Uh, we start right when we get here, uh, eight-hour weeks on the front of it uh, with strength and conditioning and skill work and individual work and just finished up our 45-day team segment. I uh, thought it was productive. Uh, there was a few things that were really important. Obviously, we have a ton of new players, uh, so building a concept of team with uh, really good returners, a bunch of new players uh, was a priority. To this point, we've done as much as we can, you know, with that, and I think that was positive. Uh, learning a little bit more about some of the talent that we brought in and what those guys can and cannot do, and then put them in a position to go work on those things on their own for the next month uh, is something that was really, really important. Um, we're still probably not um, ready to play a game, at least in my eyes yet. Uh, we were a little slower with a lot of things and a little bit more deliberate with things this year just because of the amount of young players, new players, those types of things. But uh, the work was much more quality. And, and I say that just because the foundation of how we're going to roll uh, was more set in stone, at least with half the roster and uh, led to a lot more productivity. And I, I credit the returning players a lot in regards to that. So. Uh, kind of at a intermission point or what I would call the fourth inning of the year where these guys have to go and do their own thing. Um, we're going to itemize what we want them to get better at, strides that they need to make to put themselves in the best position to contribute uh, to our team's success. And they'll go do that uh, right now after they get finals wrapped up and ready to go. And then uh, we'll be rocking and rolling in January. Um, lots of new faces, obviously, you said. Um, what freshmen really stood out to you this fall then as far as making strides? I know that you don't like to single out players, but I'm asking. <laughs> yeah, no, I think um, it's not that at all. I just think uh, a lot of times there's, uh, it's more of, there's more than one. <laughs> so I, I don't want to leave anybody out, and that's certainly the case this year. I mean, on the pitching side of it, uh, clear and oh, 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 far away, Chase Shores um, is, is the most ready to make a significant impact. Uh, I feel very fortunate that we were able to get him through the Major League Baseball draft, and I think uh, the talent is easy to see. I mean, it's, you know, he's very tall, a lot taller than me, um, you know, 6'8", something like that. But his body control, his athleticism, uh, but the poise and the mound presence and the confidence uh, very advanced, you know, for a player of that age. This is a big jump. Um, so he really stands out on the pitching side of things. Uh, there's certainly more than that. We think Griffin Herring is going to be really good left-hander. You know, we're trying to add more left-handed pitching to the program. Um, you know, his fastball was up to 93, kind of surprisingly almost, and then can spin a really good breaking ball. Uh, him and Wes Johnson are working on some things that can maybe push him up to, to make a contribution um, earlier. 
in his career than maybe you would might think. Um, those are probably the two on that side of it. Aiden Moffitt has a, tr a big time arm. I mean, he's up to 98 miles an hour and um, really showed some flashes. I think he struck out five in two innings yesterday in our Fall World Series. So that was great to see. Um, so really exciting to have some really good young pitching, you know, in the program, um, you know, and those three guys kind of stand out on that side. On the position player side of it, if you followed any of the scrimmages, uh, we got those guys a lot of playing time. Um, you know, Jared Jones has a lot of talent. He's a big physical hitter uh, with good ability to hit, not just hit for power. Um, had some success in those games. Uh, had a couple home runs in, in the games against McNeese and Louisiana Lafayette. Uh, Paxton Kling's a terrific athlete. Um, center field can really defend, can really run, uh, has power, um, really all the tools, you know, that you look for. Uh, Brady Neal did a great job this fall uh, from a catching standpoint, a good left-handed bat. So, um, you know, those guys are going to get opportunities to contribute. Gavin Guidry is certainly really talented as well. So um, it's, it's exciting when you look at it. Like, uh, it's hard to be um, a contributing freshman player in the SEC in baseball. Um, we played 12 of the 14 teams last year, counting the conference tournament, and there was only eight freshmen that started against us as position players out of like 108 guys. Like that's that's pretty hard to do. And I think those guys have the, the talent uh, to make a positive contribution early. It'll just be getting up to the speed of the game and, and having the ability to slow it down so their talent can be used. And um, normally it, it takes somebody pretty special like a Dylan Cruz or Jacob Berry or Kate Doty or somebody like that to be able to crack in. But I really think, I really think a few of these guys are going to be able to do it. Um, and so we're in individual meetings right now and, and trying to itemize the things that they're going to need to do to be able to do that because um, it's certainly not easy. But I, I like our chances of a few of them being able to contribute. Hi, Coach. Right up here. Here you are. Um, so with the addition of a bunch of new transfers, a bunch of new freshmen, I'm sure this fall kind of opened your eyes to see where you're going to place these guys. But do you kind of like tell them that like, you know, your spot's not secure. You still have to fight for where you want to play and who you, if you're going to start because you do have an addition of so many talented athletes? Yeah, I mean, I, there's a really good quote I like. It's like uh, success is not owned, it's rented, and your rent is due every day. Like, that's one of my favorite quotes. And if you're running a really elite program, which we're trying to do that here, that's a mantra. It's not like our mantra, but like, yeah. And I think, I mean, we can get some pretty simple ones out of the way. I mean, Dylan Cruz is going to play. You know what I mean? Trey Morgan's going to play. Um, it, but I don't even have to say that. They see that in terms of how talented those guys are, but how they compete and, and really how engaged they are in what we're trying to do. I mean, they both have really unique qualities. I mean, you know, Dylan's physical strengths are easy to see, but mentally he's superb, you know, and, and in Trey, and he's really talented, but he's so competitive and wants to win. And, you know, right now is bringing it like every single day. And so what you hope for is that the players that maybe are just I don't want to say a step down from that, but aren't to that level yet. We'll look at that, and they may not be able to um, take and, and be as talented. That's out of their control, but the controllable things that they can do, do those on a daily basis, then everybody starts kind of positively affecting each other and lifting everybody up. And we're not really in a place where, hey, this guy's going to go here, this guy's going to go. We're a lot further along than we were at the beginning. Um, as we should be, but we're not to opening night yet. And I've always said, I mean, at game 12, you know, the, t the thing looks different than it did opening night usually. And in the beginning of conference player, the middle of conference player, the NCAA tournament, um, you know, we had some pitchers that didn't pitch a lot for us early in the year last year that ended up being pretty significant contributors. So, um, I feel much better though, like about the pieces and how we can align them. And we have more options and in, in, in flexibility as far as lineup flexibility, pitching rotation flexibility to be able to do things that hopefully put us in an, an advantage. And you really, it's almost like a necessity now, you know, just because the league is, is good and uh, will be challenged, which is great. Uh, that's why guys come here. 
and um, it's going to be a lot of fun. And, and hopefully um, we can get in the right frame of mind so they can mentally execute the things that we need to do to win and then really stay connected as a team. You know, if there's, there's two targets, I mean, those are the two targets is help players learn to grow and, and really be able to whatever mental game task they have to tackle to be their best, help them do that and then make sure we're really connected as a unit, you know, and, and create uh, synergy or kind of power and in, in really being connected. And, you know, we, it hasn't been tested. We haven't had any adversity, but they're doing a really nice job of that, you know, and we're mindful of the things. And I always think leadership is looking out ahead of where could your trouble spots be. And if you can predict it, a lot of times you can prevent it. Yeah, you, you touched on him a little bit, I mean, but Dylan Cruz is turning a national player of the year. Looks like he's playing a different sport at times. Just in what ways have you seen him develop throughout this offseason? And does he look like a different player than even from last year? Yeah, I actually think uh, there have been a, a couple small improvements on the baseball side of it, which is hard to imagine. I think he's a not a good cent defensive center fielder anymore. He's an elite defensive center fielder. And uh, that's awesome uh, to see that. Um, you know, about mid-fall, he made a couple of adjustments that he was doing with some approach things and was hard to get out the last four or five weeks, or four weeks, let's say, um, which just shows you his quality, uh, has a really good plan uh, for getting himself prepared for the season. So there you go. I mean, it's a guy that could probably rest on his laurels, do nothing, just the bare minimum is, is actually taking it to another level right now. kind of reminds me of like a, Kobe Bryant, you know, mentality in that regard. And then I think the other thing that stands out, and he doesn't have to do it, but just the how much he cares about the team and the leadership piece and speaking up and helping guys along. And it's kind of funny. We were over at Louisiana Lafayette last Sunday, and I was sitting next to him and Trey Morgan in the dugout, and it's like both of them were talking the entire time. I wanted to be like, who are you guys? <laughs> like, I mean, this is – it's kind of awesome, to be honest with you. So that's something I really appreciate. And um, you won't find, you know, one player in that in our program that's not pulling for him because of you know how he operates like that. But it's a it's a really good example and in, in how he works and leads and all that and and using his voice more now too. So it's it's awesome to see. I can't wait to see him talk. That'll be fun. Um, you talked about having options in maybe ways last year that you weren't uh, equipped to do so. Do you feel like you filled a lot of the holes or are filling the holes and, and that, that rent statement that you talked about will kind of take care of itself? I, I do. The rest, I guess? Yeah, I do. Um, and I'll, I'll try to answer the question as best I can. I think that, um, you know, when you're coaching um, and developing, I think for the players, like the best – thing I can do for them is give them like the the mental discipline to just focus on their job and the task at hand and be present and all that boring stuff that I'm sure you hear from all of us you know what I mean but it's it is real for them to reach their potential but then you know I'm the one person and I, I really don't even love my assistant coaches doing it to like look ahead to you know maybe the this year or the next year after that or the next year after that and say where can we get better and I think through development, you know, and there's certainly really good examples of that you'll see on our team, you know, Ty Floyd, Grant Taylor. I mean, those guys are really developing, and they deserve a lot of credit for it. I think Ty started kind of midway through the season last year, and, and there's a lot of credit to them and then, to him. And then you add, you know, Coach Wes Johnson into the mix and, and the wisdom that he has and the ability to connect and teach that he has. Um, he's making a, a massive step forward. So it's a player that was on your team, but they're not necessarily the same player. So a lot of the, the holes are getting filled that way. And, and some of it you can't get through without experience. You know, it, it's kind of marvel at, you know, the football team a little bit. We have some really good freshmen playing for us and, and playing really well. And that's, that's like outlier stuff or like, you know, a Dylan Cruz or Jacob Berry or Tommy White being as good as they were in their freshman seasons. Um, so we certainly are trying to solve or close the gap on elite with development and then obviously in recruiting. And I, I feel like we've done that. Now you have to go play and you have to go execute the play. But I feel very good about being closer to be able to do that um, with the way 
that we've recruited and the way some of these guys have developed. Um, middle infield defense was kind of a point of weakness last year. Um, I know that you started coaching the, mid, uh, the infielders in the middle of last season, but um, what have you seen from those positions? And is that is second base like a position that maybe a true we could see a true freshman? I noticed you also had Jack Merrifield playing a little bit of shortstop. Yeah, a lot to that. I'll try to remember everything. Um, you know, relative to their development, um, I think. Jordan didn't get off to a great start. He played very well the back half of the season. And it's just, it would be ignorant not to look at that and acknowledge that. And I think that speaks to him and his toughness and competitiveness. Uh, he made one error the entire fall. And, and he missed a couple games with the, the hamstring deal, but he was exceptional. And, um, you know, I've had pro teams like, you know, talking to me about that's what a major league shortstop looks like. And if you, were around at all. You definitely saw some. Fl you saw flashes of it at times last year, but uh, you saw great consistency of it. He's he's healthy. He's playing low. I mean, you know, looks like Brandon Crawford of the San Francisco Giants a lot, and um, really happy for him and excited for our team. You know, because that's that will be great. Um, you know, relative to the second base thing. I mean, we've, we've used a lot of guys, sometimes out of necessity, just with not having a lot of depth just in infielders, period, uh, because of the Major League Baseball draft, moving guys to the position. A couple guys are out, moving outfielders to the infield. Um, you know, you'll, we'll see a lot of guys play that position. I think um, last Saturday we played the game, or Sunday, against UL. We actually played the game straight up where, you know, like if we pinch hit for somebody, we rolled somebody in and didn't you know, just mix and match like a fall game. And I think Jack, Ben DePole, and Gavin Gidry all played second throughout the game. And you may see some of that kind of stuff. And they're all good players, and I feel like we can be successful with all of them. You know, and Gavin Dugas missed the last three weeks with a eye procedure. You know, I, I wanted him to get his eyes checked. And then when they did that, they went and found, like, this thing underneath his cornea that had to be removed and so that was good for him and so you know he was doing fine uh, as well so you know there's a lot of and I mean we had to throw Paxton Kling in there a couple times I think Joe Bear played second base which you know that you know not something maybe I would have had scripted out but you know try to get them under the mindset of you're a baseball player you don't have to be pigeonholed into something and um, I think there's a lot of guys that'll be able to get the job done. Hey, Jay, regarding Tommy White's power numbers, the ACC put nine teams in the postseason last year. He's mm -hmm. obviously seen quality arms. What are your expectations for his transition into the Southeastern Conference? Yeah, it's a good question. Actually, I just met with him like an hour ago, and I'm doing individual meetings today and tomorrow. And we talked about that a little bit, and I think the benefit of us upgrading our pitching staff, I mean, he was the first one to say, like, this is better pitching than I, I faced last year. And I thought that was a good acknowledgement of him. And then we talked about the things that he needs to do to, let's just say, have the right approach or control his at-bats to be consistent. I think he's an elite hitter. Uh, I think the power really jumps off the page, and that gets a lot of attention, and rightfully so, because not too many guys hit, I don't know, you know, 27 home runs or something like that, 28 home runs. But he'd also hit 360-something you know, in a conference that was very good, and he did about the same. I mean, in the fall this year against our pitching um, to get seven or eight home runs. So I'm enjoying coaching him on both sides of the ball. I think um, it's one thing, you know, if, if a guy had that kind of success to come in and kind of say, I go, got it all figured out. It's actually the opposite. It's, uh, you know, wanting more, you know, early work defense at third base. And he's done a very good job there, too. Um, frankly, exceeded my expectations with where he's at from that standpoint. And then the hitting thing, there's a few things that I think, believe it or not, that he can do better. And he's been very open to doing them. And we've seen some good results. I mean, there was an at bat this fall where I literally said, hey, I think this is what's going to happen. And if it does, this is what I want you to do. And it, I mean, he did it and did it better than I laid it out. I was like, this, this guy's different, you know? So he's been very, very enjoyable to coach, you know, to this point.
Hey, Coach. Uh, one of the things that uh, has been noticeable this fall is that some of the pitchers have picked up their speeds, uh, including Grant Taylor. Um, I noticed he also pitched a couple of pitches for uh, 97 miles per hour. What have the pitchers done to improve their speed? Yeah, I think some of it is just time and maturity. I never want a player, position player, pitcher, to come into our program and leave and feel like they regressed. And, and there's certainly a development component to that. Um, I've said this before. I think when we got Coach Wes Johnson, we didn't get the best college baseball pitching coach. We got the best pitching coach in all of baseball. And that's a multi-layered thing. Like, that's not just – there's a lot of guys that do something really well in terms of how they develop. And there's a lot of good pitching coaches out there. I just think he's really complete in knowledge, you know, and, and sometimes guys will get pigeonholed. Hey, he really knows analytics or – you know, the, the rap soda, the track man, and can really, you know, decipher what those numbers mean and put together a development program for a Grant Taylor that's going to help him increase velocity. He definitely can do all that. But then there's just a way to communicate all that and take the information and put it in a way that the player can be a good learner and understand. Um, and then an ability to connect with them and and do it in a way that, it's a logical system that is inspiring that gets the player to want to go and then you see the results and then everybody wants to do it, you know, which is buy-in, which is the most important part of coaching and developing. So when you hire somebody like Wes, you have immediate buy-in. I mean, all those guys want to do is be a major league pitcher someday. Well, we just got a guy that was a major league pitching coach from a first place team that, you know, earlier as, as an example, and you talk about credibility, it's like Chris Archer just came and hung out with us for like three days just because he was hanging out with Wes, you know, and that's definitely a guy these guys look up to because of the impact that he's made on him. So I think the first part is there is a complete buy-in to what they're being taught. Then we have a new strength and conditioning coach uh, named Derek Groomer uh, who came from Alabama, Birmingham, who is outstanding, like, big time outstanding relative to assessing the players, getting their body to be functional in terms of how they move down the mound, the things that they need to do programming wise to execute that. So you put that together and then you put together this pitching development plan. I mean, Grant's not the only one, you know, in that regard. And then just there's more guys that can do it from a physical standpoint. You talk about Chase Shores, Aiden Moffitt, Bryce Collins has made a really good jump, you know, so um, it's been exciting to see. And I think they're, they're bought in and they're just highly committed to what they're doing. Jay, uh, certainly not to knock last year's team, but uh, what is this year's team going to allow you to do in terms of your coaching style and <laughs> the things that you want to, yeah. to, to accomplish yeah. that maybe you couldn't quite do last year? Yeah, I, I, I want to – answer this correctly um, and truthfully is, you know, I'm very proud of that group. I, I, I will, I, I know what the expectations are. I know what the standards are. I, nobody wants to win a national title more than I do, you know what I mean? Or, or be in Omaha more than I do. There's not one person in this community that loves LSU that wants us to do better than, than I do, I think. Um, but I think those guys really got the best out of themselves. And I have always viewed my job to help them get the best out of themselves and so I think we just had to really think creatively and it doesn't mean that I won't think creatively this year because I will and there's already some things like percolating with myself and our staff of lining things up in a certain way you know or, or thinking outside the box it may not be in the context of winning seven SEC games before you, when you made a pitching change before the end of the third inning I mean like I mean, that's kind of extreme measure, you know, type coaching. Um, but, you know, on the, on the flip side, there's always something that we can do to create a competitive advantage for having our team prepared. And we're always looking to find those things. So I don't know. I just think, you know, you want to have the ability to match up in talent, you know, and, um, you know, when you face some of the pitching staffs that are in the SEC, and they're out there again this year, no question about it, um, we'll maybe just have a little better chance to match up, you know, I, I think. And um, I envision probably more of our games being a little lower scoring, you know, relative to uh, 
you know, the competition we play, but then our ability to hold, hold serve, you know, a little bit better in that. And so then what is the game called for? And then it's about teaching your offense to execute in a way that we're going to hit home runs. Like, we're going to hit home runs on this team. But, like, that's not going to be the case always against the best pitcher, you know, in the league or in the country. So the ability to manufacture them. And actually, last year's team was very efficient at that. We were very good at getting runners in from third with less than two outs statistically. And it's stuff we coach all the time. So I don't know that it's all that different. I just want us to be prepared to win any type of game on any type of day, home or road, conditions, team, ballpark, doesn't matter. I just think maybe the ability to match up a little bit more straight up, uh, we're in a much better position to do that from a, a starting pitching standpoint. Coach, as you said, the expectations are always the expectations here, and I don't know what it matters in late November, but there you know, is a lot of talk. This is the number one team in the country, and this and that. I guess some of your older guys like, Trey and Dylan, they may not care about that, but how, with the younger players, how do they maybe get excited about the potential, but then at the same time realize we hadn't done anything yet and we need to work hard? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think one of my biggest jobs, is, we'll just call it with this generation, is understanding uh, the difference between substance and image, you know, hype and reality. And it's, it's about the play. I mean, baseball is a unique sport where it's not the team with the best players. It's the team that plays the best that day. You've probably already heard me say that before. And I know it's boring and it's not something that's catchy. But I have this saying, too, that we're never going to accept in winning what we wouldn't accept in losing. And so it always comes back to the play. And so we're always focused on the play. And then the things that really, really matter. Like, hey, I understand we were able to overcome this in this particular game. But, you know, when you're trying to win at the level everybody here at this place wants to win at, we have to be awesome at managing all the details. And so it's trying to immerse them in that way of thinking or way of being so much so that that's that. And it's fun for all of you guys to talk about and write about, and, and, and it's awesome. It makes playing here awesome. But it doesn't really have anything to do with how we perform. Like, they need to stay focused on what they need to do so they can be the best version of themselves and we can perform. So that's kind of, that's kind of my thoughts on that. Uh, just kind of bouncing off Scott's question a little bit. I know one of the areas you wanted to really see improvement in this year is just aggressiveness on the bags. I mean, have you been able to see that this off season in terms of your speed? And just is that going to be another way for you guys to be able to generate runs next season? I think it can be. I think there's a little more athleticism, and it maybe depends on how lineups shake out. But here's my style of, of offense at baseball: is what do we need to do to win? Um, I've said this before, I think the first time we went to Omaha to Arizona, we led the country in sacrifice bunts. The second time we went to Omaha, I think we had 18 sacrifice bunts for the entire season. You know, and we coached the whole part of it. Therefore, we're never um, subjected to or limited to a certain type of game is being played a certain way that we can't function or execute in. So now you look back through last year, uh, there wasn't a ton of speed. I mean, I'll just take Jordan, like, um, he had a knee injury, and he was probably one of the better runners. You know, uh, Tyler McManus was the catcher. He played the whole year with a torn meniscus. Trey Morgan had a knee injury. You know, so there's three of your nine that physically just can't do it. Um, Jacob Berry, best hitter there was in college baseball last year. Not really a burner, you know what I mean? So, you know, but you look at, at Dylan, healthy Trey, Paxton Kling, Gavin Guidry, excellent athletes. Jordan, healthy. So it could be there, but at the same time, like, we want to create a big inning because if you win a, the big inning of the game, you have a 90 to 92% chance of winning the game. And so there's a lot that goes into that. And sometimes you just have to evaluate the risk-reward. Great, we could steal a base, but if we get thrown out and I just took – Tommy White, Dylan Cruz, Trey Morgan, any of the – Jared Jones, any of these freshmen have an opportunity to drive a ball in the gap that's not smart baseball. So uh, 
I would like to I would like to have us be a problem to deal with on as many fronts as we can because then you make it really difficult on the opposing pitcher and pitching coach. So that's always the the goal. Good question. You also wanted to add more depth to the catching position, which you did. What did you see from those new catchers this fall? Yeah, I mean, as a as a whole, I think um, not a new one, but Alex Malazzo, healthy, uh, which is great for us. Uh, he's done a great job um, defensively, as he always does. You know, handling pitchers and those types of things. He also did a terrific job, you know, mentoring those younger players, um, which was great. Um, Hayden Travinsky, he's been very, he's been injured throughout the whole fall um, with leg stuff, so, and has, has been sick. So he had kind of limited time back there. Um, you know, Brady, I think, uh, Brady Neal is probably the most advanced receiver, blocker, thrower. Um, he's built very well to be a good defensive catcher. Obviously a really good left-handed hitter as well. Um, I thought he did an exceptional job uh, last Sunday when we were at Louisiana Lafayette, you know, when I talk about being multidimensional offensively and giving you a lot to deal with and being a problem, they're as good as anybody in the country um, at running that type of style and system. So part of the reason I threw him back there uh, for a good portion of the day was like, hey, man, if you can withstand this, then you can withstand anything. And he did a nice job, and him and Alex split the day there, and they both did a good job. We were able to and part of it was good pitching, but we were able to contain the running situation there, and Brady did a good job with that. Jared's got a really good throwing arm. Ethan's got a really good throwing arm. They're big-bodied guys, which is a good target to throw to. I think all of them just need experience, you know, between the season and summer ball next year and, and those types of things. I, I would guess it'd be like in football having three freshman quarterbacks. There's a lot to – you just got to go kind of – one thing at a time. Thank you. All right, guys, we'll bring up uh, Ty Floyd first. Uh, Ty is a junior right-hander out of Rockmart, Georgia. Uh, he's been one of the most versatile pitchers we've had. Uh, as a freshman, he had 20 relief appearances. And last year, he had 10 starts and, and six more relief appearances. And as Coach Jay in uh, indicated earlier, he has uh, really developed this fall under Coach Wes Johnson. So we'll bring up Ty to take your questions. Yeah, uh, hey Ty. Just um, you know, Bill just mentioned it, but just what, what what kind of things were you working on this off season, and just how have you grown? I guess your game, uh, you know, the last several months and into this fall as well. Yeah, I mean, uh, the whole off season, I didn't go play summer ball. I uh, just worked on my off speed pitches all fall or all summer. Uh, worked with really the guy back home and just continued to work out and just. Uh, and then when I got here, early in the summer, started working with Coach West to even more develop those pitches. I guess what, what kind of impact has Wes had on you in the last couple months? Have you noticed a pretty significant jump in your game with those off-speed pitches? Yes, um, I feel like I've improved a lot over the past uh, couple months. Not just me. I mean, everybody on the team's improved an incredible amount. I think uh, Wes has honestly done. Coach Wes has done great things for me, not only from the mechanical side of the part of the game, but also the mental side of, of the game. Um, what is it like having Alex Malazzo back catching, and what are th what is it like throwing to some of these new freshmen? Yeah, I mean, Alex has been great. I've been fortunate to throw to Alex the past three years. He's been nothing but uh, great behind the plate for me. But uh, it's been great. You got to throw to Brady Neal, Ethan Frey, and Jared Jones. They've been great behind the plate. I think uh, all of them are going to make a huge impact this year behind the plate for us. I guess, where do you, like, see your role on the staff? And, you know, how have you kind of tried to get some of these new transfers and freshmen to acclimate to the program? 
Yeah, I mean, I, of course, it's early in the year. I don't know our any of our roles yet, just yet. But I uh, feel like I've already talked to Coach West or Coach Coach Johnson and Coach West about all that stuff, and they just told me that just be ready to be able to make a big impact on the team and then pitching the important innings. And I tell this, tell all the freshmen the same thing, just knowing that when your time comes, be ready to step on the mound and do your job. Uh, just the impact of having you know these transfers in here, Chase, um, Thatcher, Christian. Just how have you gotten to know them, and just what have you seen from those guys in these first few months? Yeah, I mean, I got, I became pretty close with Paul and Thatcher and some of the other transfers, and uh, their work ethic's amazing. Uh, they're there more than anybody else, especially Skeens is there a lot too because he's there hitting too as well. So, but their work ethic's amazing. Their passion for the game's phenomenal. So. Um, I'm excited to see him pitch this year. All right, we'll bring up uh, Tommy White. Tommy uh, transferred from North Carolina State, uh, 27 home runs, uh, ACC Freshman of the Year last year, as Coach Johnson mentioned. And, uh, he's playing third base uh, this fall and uh, expected to be the third baseman this year for the Tigers. So, uh, Tommy White, to take your questions. Hi, Tommy. I'm Leah. I'm from The Advocate. I'll be covering your season this year. Um, just what's it been like coming to LSU and, you know, how was your fall experience, your first fall experience here? Um, yeah, LSU is awesome. Uh, I love it here. Um, but the fall's been great. Uh, a lot of work, which we all needed it. It's a, uh, it's good to get around a new team, and uh, I mean our team chemistry is really well, so everybody's really gelled together. So I think the fall has really helped that being together twenty four seven. Hey Tommy, uh, my name's Glenn West. I'm working with twenty four seven Sports. Um, just your your journey here. Could you just talk about it a little bit? What drew you to LSU when you entered the portal, conversations with Coach Johnson, just talk about what kind of wanted you to come here. Yeah, um, I actually never thought I'd be going to LSU. Um, I w was never on my radar. Um, but Coach Johnson reached out, and uh, he ended up coming to my house. And it was it was awesome. Like he, he, was, he was a great guy. He showed me everything, laid out a whole plan that he had for me while I'm here. And I took a visit here, and I fell in love with Baton Rouge, so I, I ended up committing right away. I didn't even make my other visits. I just said I'm coming here. Uh, obviously, people focus on the home runs, but you, you had a, you had a very good year with RBIs and and, and batting average. Where, where does people people think about the home runs, or where does that the power part of it fit into your whole hitting approach? What are you trying to do at the plate? I mean, you, go, you can't go up there thinking about home runs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just look to do a job. I mean, I just go up there thinking of whatever the situation is just to get my job done. Uh, if that's just a ground ball to second base or if, if, if I need to try to drive one. But I never think home runs. I just think line drives up the middle and uh, hit it where it's pitched. I mean, most of my home runs went to right field, so I just try to keep going that side and take curveballs to the left field and stuff. But, yeah, I just, I just hit it where it's pitched and just try to do my job every at bat no matter what that is. Tommy, a lot of talk about you guys being the top team in the country and to win a national title, which I guess they always say here to an extent. But is that the biggest reason why you came here? And how do you get excited about that potential but then realize we haven't done anything yet, we have to work hard between now and then? Yeah, I mean, I mean, LSU is always in the talks to win a national title. And I knew that coming in here. I knew the history about this place. But I also knew what Coach Johnson was trying to do with the team and uh, uh, make, it, make it almost a super team. And uh, – we have all the tools to make to to be a national team, no doubt. But not only that is we have to we, we have worked very very hard. We aren't just going to roll out there and expect to beat everybody. We we've put in the time and we have a lot more to do. But uh, yeah, no doubt um, this team is definitely a national t uh, championship caliber team, no doubt. But there's a lot more work to be done. Um, you've been working at third base. I don't know how much you got to play in the field last year. So what points of growth did you need to see from yourself there? And how has it been working at the position? Yeah, uh, I played third base my entire life. So it was, it was kind of hard to not play it last year at NC State. But um, I just needed that confidence boost back just to get back used to it. Um, I've been over there every single day in the fall. 
and I've gotten com just as comfortable as I was in high school, so I have my confidence back over there, and uh, I'm really excited. I, third base has always been my home. I just had to realize that. Just what about Alec Box Stadium? I know you're out there practicing, and it's empty right now for the most part. But have you thought about you know weekend series when you play SEC teams and what it's going to be like to to be there? Oh, I've I've imagined it already. It's it's pretty crazy. Stepping every single time I step on the field, I'm like, wow, I'm actually going to play like a lot of games here. It's kind of crazy to think about. It's like a Triple A stadium. It's awesome. And you can't get mad about two jumbotrons on the outfield and everything. It's pretty cool.